Well, hello and welcome. And you are not imagining things. We are here at a different time today. Uh, we're here at noon Eastern time, which, of course, if you're on the West Coast, that may be nine o'clock in the morning for you. Uh, if you're in New Zealand, uh, I've got to think about the math. Uh, probably, oh gosh, it's probably in the, in the middle of the night. So you might not be joining us live from New Zealand today, but if you get a chance to watch afterwards, you'll know we were at a different time today. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, I'm excited about our show today. We've got some great stuff coming up. Uh, but before I dive in, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Guy Stevens. I'm the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. And of course, if you're not familiar with the Alliance, we're an organization that formed a little over four years ago. Uh, we are really focused on not only things like restraint and seclusion, uh, but suspension, expulsion, corporal punishment, even more broadly, kind of all the things that are often being done to kids uh, very often in the name of behavior. And we're trying to push for changes in laws, changes in practices so that we can better support uh, not only kids, but teachers and staff as well. Uh, you know, education is a uh, difficult and challenging job. And certainly these have been tough times in recent years, uh, you know, kind of following the pandemic and everything else going on. Uh, so we're here really to collaborate and to work with others to find solutions and to move things forward. So again, if you're joining us live uh, here, please uh, go to the chat and tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, I always enjoy sharing with the guests uh, where we have people joining us from, and it's always fun to see. And again, I, I realize we might not have our, our New Zealand friends today, but we typically have people from all over the world. So it's a lot of fun to see where you're from, uh, whether it's here in the U.S. Or, or somewhere else. So tell us in the comments who you are and where you're from. So I do want to let you know in terms of our show today, um, I am very excited to have our guest with us, Paulina uh, Shadrin, and Paulina is joining us for a special discussion. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of trauma-informed approaches. We're going to talk uh, a lot about, uh, you know, uh, Paulina's work in supporting people, and uh, I think it'll be a really fun conversation. Uh, as always, this event is being recorded, uh, so it will be available uh, live, of course, on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and as an audio podcast, but after the fact, you can go to any of those channels as well. And view it so if you're not able to watch the whole thing right now you can come back and, and listen or watch later so with all of that let's get to the exciting part because the exciting part oops the exciting part is not you listening to me and as i went down on my screen to let our guest in i noticed my guest has disappeared so it looks like uh we might have had a short technical difficulty here uh, and uh, hopefully we're, we're working on getting her reconnected here. So in the meantime, you know, if you would tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, we'll go ahead and introduce our guest here in a moment, uh, assuming that she's able to join us uh, again here momentarily. Uh, all right, and I see Beth from San Jose, California, educator, parent of two autistic sons, a volunteer, advocator for Lives in the Balance, fantastic. Uh, Cass, I see Cass Griffin Bennett from Washington State, uh, also a uh, recent volunteer here at the Alliance uh, and one that's doing some amazing work. Uh, who else is watching us live? Let us know. And I'm hoping that we're going to have our guest here. Uh, here we go. We're, we're getting our guest rejoined here. Well, hello there. We lost Great. you. I, I, I came I back from the introduction. I'm like, and now it's time to do the, the fun part to introduce our guest. And poof, you were gone. And I, I never had... I disappeared. <laughs> I've never had a guest leave me. I mean, I've never had a guest like <laughs> that introduction was not what I was thinking it was going to be. I'm out of here. And I thought, oh, gee, this is going to be an interesting show here. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you're back. Um, little technical difficulty, perhaps. But I have not done your introduction yeah. yet. So I'm going to go ahead and read through okay. your introduction. And right. <laughs> uh, then we'll get started in a conversation. Uh, you know, and, and I had said before, I was, I was trying to get the correct pronunciation of your name. And I thought, oh, gee, I pronounced it wrong. And she left. I mean, you know, I knew I was <laughs> really going to. That was it. <laughs> I was really going to do it bad. So I'm just going to stick with your first name now, just so I don't make any more mistakes here. Uh, so <laughs> Polina is a trauma-informed uh, speech-language pathologist uh, with specialties in the area of autism, ADHD, language, and literacy. Uh, she earned her Master's of Art uh, degree in speech-language pathology from CUNY, uh, Queens College, where uh, she held the position of adjunct lecturer uh, for the past seven years. Uh, she has a Master's in, of Science degree in nutrition education from the American University, uh, which has transformed the feeding therapy portion of her practice. And that'll be interesting to talk about as well. And mm -hmm. throughout the course uh, and her career, uh, Plina has earned four ACE awards, 
uh, from the American Speech Language Hearing Association for her dedication to learning. Uh, she coaches parents using play and brain-based research to foster understanding and deeper connections, uh, layering in foundational principles of development. And of course, Plain also approaches each family dynamic from a holistic lens, acknowledging challenges, examining the environment, and focusing on promoting self-efficacy in the parent and the child. And we are really excited to have you here today. You know, it's funny because I think, you know, I, I think we met and had a conversation some time ago. And uh, yes. at some point we began booking our shows out further and further and further in advance. And I'm like, wow, it feels like forever ago that we, we uh, talked. But I remember as we were having, you know, conversations, I'm like, oh, I've got to have you on. You've got to, you've got to join <laughs> me on, uh, on an ASR Live. And, and we do this really to share information and to share ideas. And, and there was a lot that you were talking about when we met that really resonated with me and a lot about your approach. So uh, we are just thrilled to have you here today. And uh, I will try not to make any more mistakes that, that make you run off. And, uh, <laughs> and leave me here. So welcome, welcome. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and, and before you got on, I was sharing some of the uh, where people are from and, and who signed on. And I see a couple of people have jumped in. Um, you know, I, I did decide that being that it's probably around three o'clock in the morning in New Zealand, we might not see our New Zealand friends now, but hopefully we'll see them on the uh, uh, the uh, recorded event. But we have somebody here from Connecticut. Uh, let's Great. see, uh, Devana Smith from Connecticut and Think Kids. Okay, uh, Think Kids uh, University of Massachusetts, I believe. Uh, love your webinar so much. Uh, you're doing noble and important work. Thank you, and thank you uh, if you're working with Think Kids for the work that you're doing. Uh, we have someone here, uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole is a friend and ally from New Jersey, a uh, previous uh, educator as well. Uh, Cass uh, Griffith Bennett from Washington State, a volunteer. And we've got uh, an educator and parent of two autistic sons from San Jose. So we've got a couple of people that have uh, jumped in on the chat and said hello. Uh, but again, uh, if you're on here, tell us who you are and where you're from. I see a Sunday from Michigan uh, just joining on us as well. So you and I had an opportunity, and I'm trying to remember uh, how we connected in the first place. Uh, but I think it was probably a connection through a connection of some sort. Um, but, you know, we, we had an opportunity to connect and, and have some conversation uh, around the work that you're doing. And I wonder if uh, a good starting point, uh, you know, I read your bio, but is to tell us a little bit about uh, how you went down the road that you went down. So how did you end up doing what you do today? And, uh, you know, how did that interest kind of come to be? So can you tell us a little bit about uh, kind of your journey? Sure. So I initially never thought I was going to work with children. <laughs> I always had a, a numbers brain and I was into just puzzles and figuring out complex ideas. And I feel like the profession found me, <laughs> not the other way around. Um, I wound up stumbling into a special education preschool where my mom was actually an educator and that was almost 20 years ago. <laughs> mm. And I wow. started really, it, it's been, it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you said almost 20 years ago, and, and I don't know that I've ever shared this before and not that it's anything huge, but when I think back in the past, uh, when I was in college, I remember taking some uh, career assessment, um, uh, you know, different career assessments that you could do. And I remember speech language pathology came back as my number one choice one year when I was in school as a career. And I don't even think I knew what speech language pathology was at that point. But uh, I, 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 as you said, 20 years ago, I was like, oh, well, you know, it was probably more than 20 years ago, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to, what is that? So anyway, so you, you began to get this interest and in, in kind of what happened from there. And, you know, I had really great mentors along the way that really molded my my thinking and my approach. And I was I, from a young age, I was always termed like an overachiever a little bit. <laughs> and I was always into learning. And I, I still am. You know, you read off the the alphabet soup that follows my name, as mm -hmm. <laughs> some people like to say. And it's just because there's always such new and interesting information and me educating myself continues to support my clients. And it really took the process of, I think I was just really fortunate enough to get to be accepted into a high level graduate program where because of the program that I was in, and the people who are around me, it really 
just opened my eyes to what a relationship based approach is like what play is and how dynamic it could be and how you could get really into the world of whoever you are working with and really see it from their point of view. And I think that's over the years, I've really honed in on that skill and I can pretty much like transform my way of thinking and look at every situation from which whoever I'm working with and then be able to let the parent know, let's say if the parent is in the session, what's actually going on. And Mm -hmm. I've had some parents say, well, how did you get that? How in the world did you just figure out that what he said wasn't actually what he meant? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Or how did you see it from such a different lens? And I think it's just, you know, people talk about a sixth sense. You know, I think that's, that's part of it. It's just this intuitive nature over the years that has really helped me hone in on what does each individual child and family really need? What are they looking for? And how can I help them and bring out the strengths and really show, we, you mentioned self-efficacy, it's really showing the parent and the child that they can be successful. Mm-hmm. And what that feeling of success looks like, because then when the parent sees it and the kid's eyes light up because they just figured something out that they thought was impossible, it's that it's that feeling that, you know, this is success. Like there's Mm -hmm. no, you know, there's no stickers, there's no rewards. There are no, there are no charts. Um, I always say that all roads lead back to regulation. And Mm -hmm. if there's something challenging that's going on, it, we really have to back up and figure out what's happening to the nervous system. Mm -hmm. What's really going on underneath because you can't out reward this regulation. It's just, it's impossible. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but uh, I'll tell you that there, there sure are a lot of attempts to do that. Uh, there are a lot of attempts, uh, you know, in our, our schools in particular, uh, you know, a lot of the kind of traditional behaviorist approaches are alive and well, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think well-intentioned, um, you know, folks that are, that are there to help, uh, that are using approaches that are heavily steeped in rewards and consequences and and not realizing the you know how not only ineffective they can be but but harmful quite frankly that they yeah. can be uh, you know very often I mean you know um, you know we, we might see a, a neurodivergent child who um, you know doesn't earn a reward that they anticipated earning and you know in their mind they may have already earned that a reward and you know we might see that this regulation become, you know, the, the reward become the, the basis of a dysregulated, uh, you know, nervous system. So looking, you know, it, you know, you, you of course, um, are a consultant and you've got a, uh, uh, a consulting company called play to learn, which, you know, the title right, uh, right there, um, catches me, but, but tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing now. Like, you know, I know you work with, uh, individuals, you work with families, you work around behavior, you work around eating. Can, can you give us a high level of, of kind of some of the areas of, of work that you're doing now, uh, and, and, and a little insight into kind of how you do it? Sure. I, I, I'm, some of the work that I'm doing is really around executive functioning. And that's the, I lecture on executive functioning also for a professional development company. And it's really helping parents and professionals understand that when there is a lack of skill, that that's where we need to start. Mm -hmm. And it's about figuring out where those gaps are, because then what happens is we create an expectation gap and we almost expect kids depending on their chronological age. to just all of a sudden reach up and jump to what we expect them to do. And we're setting them up to fail in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'm looking at like, where are the difficulties? Because it's not a behavior based problem. It's a skill deficit. And right, when we can right. build up, when we can build up the skills really from, from the ground up and it's regardless of the age. I recently started with a 10 year old and I'm thinking, okay, we're working on regulation because that's where we're living and that's where the difficulties are. And mm-hmm. once we can have, once we can have her regulated and she can feel what regulation is like, then language will come to the surface. And right. it's, 
it's a it's very different and when new families come in i let them know that it might be a shock to their system if they've had experiences before and it's something that they they really want they really do want to understand because what they've been doing so far hasn't been working right, and right. That's another really great question that I ask when, even when, when I speak to other educators and they let me know that there are still these behaviors that are coming to the surface and this is what we've been doing. And the question that I ask is, that sounds great. How has it been working for you? <laughs> because mm-hmm. I know that it hasn't been. So, mm-hmm. And that's the reason that you're, that they're reaching out. So I'm looking at it's, it's an intertwining network of all of these pieces and stemming from regulation and we're going into inhibition, right? And impulse control and areas of working memory and how do we ensure basic problem solving? Because then we also start working on the language aspect and like we do address comprehension and and cognition too. You can't, if you're not understanding the information that's coming in, and you're having a difficult time sorting through all of that information, you don't know how to respond. And that's where the breakdown, that's where the breakdown occurs. So if the child isn't responding, it's because it's it's on us, right? It's really Mm -hmm. on the adults to go, it's over here. (laughs) What am I doing? Rather than what I hear often, like they're not listening, they can't sit still. Like right. they can't follow directions. And I say, okay, well, I hear a lot of cans. Where's the can? Like, right. tell me something that your kid is so, so good at. And I remember asking one parent that when we started a call, I said, this sounds great. I'm so glad you reached out. What's one thing that your child is so good at? And she paused and she goes, no one has ever asked me that. And I'm almost mm. embarrassed that I don't know how to answer because all mm. of the focus has been on what he can't do. Right, right. Rather right. than like what makes him smile? What is something that you Perfect. know will really, really engage him? Tell me what he's really good at. And, and that's that it's a strength based approach where mm-hmm, that's where mm-hmm. the research is. That's where the research is going slowly, like mm-hmm, looking mm-hmm. into, especially for ADHD, looking into resilience and a strength based approach and how that trajects from childhood into adolescence and then into adulthood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You you know, so uh, much of what you, you were talking about is, is I think very aligned with some of the other approaches out there that have, um, you know, gained some momentum, but certainly not, not enough. I think about, you know, Ross Green's work and, you know, collaborative of solutions and uh, 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 Devana, who is here with Think Kids, uh, collaborative problem solving, you know, these ideas that, you know, kids do well if they can, uh, you know, versus this predisposition, I think, that we have that think that kids do well if they want to. And and when you think kids do well if they want to, it, you frame it as a matter of motivating them, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, here, here's, a, here, here's a bag of Skittles or here's a cookie or here's something to motivate you because obviously that's a problem. When in fact, you know, so often it's a matter of skill, ability, you know, uh, other obstacles. And, uh, you know, when we're just going down this road of, you know, rewards and, and consequences, we're not getting to the underlying issues. Uh, but the, the challenge is, and, and you, you touched on this a bit, is how you uh, help people to realize that. Um, you know, we, we've got uh, an audience here of, you know, people that have, uh, you know, um, really, I think, come, come to some of these realizations about, you know, the, the importance of relationships, the importance of right. connection, uh, the fact that if, if, if a kid is dysregulated, if any of us are dysregulated, yes. our, our thinking brain is, is going offline, right? Um, so, uh, you know, and, and again, many people are going to bring up Cass's comment here, rewards are super counterproductive for many neurodivergent kids, uh, and I wish more educators understood that. So yeah. to that <laughs> point, um, you know, do you, you know, you, you work with parents, do you, do you work with educators as well? And, 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 you know, whether it be a parent or an educator, what else do you do to kind of lead people in this direction? Because this is one of the, the key challenges here is some of this information is there in terms of understanding the way the brain works in terms of understanding better approaches, but it's not widely adopted. Um, I so know. <laughs> tell me about things you found to, to help in that direction. 
I think I've come up against uh, more challenges mm -hmm. when even attempting to like break into the school system right. and having calls with different areas like of the department of education and saying like, let me help your school. <laughs> like, let right, me just, right. let me do this for you <laughs> because it's not just for the neurodivergent kids. I said, anyone can right. benefit. The yeah. fact that your general education classroom teacher can look for certain tidbits and really like, yes, it's a large classroom and like, yes, the, the teachers have so much going on and yet there's just like such a small and simple it's a mindset shift of mm -hmm. the the words that we're using and this is where the language piece comes in because we could say the same thing but we're not really saying the same thing right right because right. the words that i'm using i'm choosing are really really strategic and then the child responds completely differently and when you see that it's and the parents look at the results, you get this aha moment of, oh, so he didn't throw the toy because the first thing I said to him wasn't a no. Mm -hmm. And I go, right. Because imagine how many times a day he gets, he or she gets hit with a no, mm -hmm. where it's constant. It's like, right. and everything is a no. So now they're living in the world of no, mm -hmm. where we really want them to live in the world of yes. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and I think it's the, the professional development piece I, has been really, really crucial. And that's something that um, has opened up the understanding of other mental health professionals where they've, they've known a little bit about executive function pieces, but they don't quite know how they're intertwined with social emotional development mm -hmm. and language and cognition. And we're looking at all of these aspects and developmental domains as being separate and they can't be. And that's where we're looking at the child as a whole and the person as a whole, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. we have to figure out like, yes, th the cognition may be like super high where you're looking at an IQ score and you're saying, well, he's really smart. Why can't he understand that this isn't allowed? And I go, okay, well, we're looking at a social emotional piece too. Mm -hmm. And that social emotional aspect is where we really need to, where we really need to be. And once, once that grows, it's everything else is going to slowly fall into place. Mm -hmm. You'll see, I'll, I tell an educator also, I, I, I say that we're not, the reason I don't work on the behavior is because it's going to disappear. Right. It'll go, it'll, it'll, it'll disappear on its own because the nervous system is not going to need it. Right. The child's not going to need to feel like they're always protecting themselves or they're always on high alert because the stress level is so high. Mm -hmm. They're they're going to know that, OK, eventually I can figure out what's happening with me, like what's going on and why my like really why my nervous system is responding in a certain way. And depending on the age, the language, obviously the language changes, the methodology stays the same. It's still acknowledging the fact that like, this was really hard, you know, like your block tower fell over. You're, you're right. Okay. Let's just sit there here in this discomfort. And instead of distracting from that discomfort, we want to help kids work through the discomfort. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is, can be really challenging in the beginning. It's being comfortable around somebody else's discomfort and mm -hmm. not allowing that discomfort to dysregulate you. Right, right, right. And, and, and there is, therein is part of the key, right? Uh, the the, the well-regulated adult, whether it's a caregiver, whether it's a professional, whether it's an educator, um, you know, as we begin to become dysregulated, everything at that point goes in the wrong direction. But it, it's it's hard to do sometimes. It's, it's hard to always... Uh, yes you know, keep yourself regulated. But I think, you know, that's where we've got to look for strategies to help support educators and others that are in these situations. You know, one of the things that you struck me from what you said, and it struck me in kind of a, a sad and tragic way, uh, you know, when you talked about how, you know, kind of approaching from a strength space that you would talk to parents and they, you know, you'd ask them about, you know, what, what they were good at. And, you know, one of the things that comes to mind quickly with that is the difficulty you know, being a parent sometimes in, in a, a system that, 
you know, you go to an IEP meeting and all you're hearing is all the negative things about your child. Mm -hmm. I can tell you because I've sat in those meetings and heard those things about my own child um, that it, that it's really difficult. How do you how do you help parents that have been in that position to begin to discover and appreciate uh, the things about their child that you know again you know um, when we look at um, you know again every individual and and all the individual differences between us all uh, you know there is so much that can be amazing about people that is overlooked or unappreciated or undervalued or underestimated. Um, so how, how do you work with parents to help them to kind of realize, um, you know, what makes their own child special? We, we highlight the small things because yeah. the small things are the big things <laughs> where, and this is why oftentimes uh, I invite parents like into the therapy setting. And I, the, the first thing I tell them is wear comfortable clothing because we move around a lot. <laughs> Uh, like make sure that you are ready to go. And it's important to then note on like, did you just notice like this in particular, this right here is going to lead to, and then all of the other steps, because I, I can foresee where it's going. And as a parent, if you're just stuck in this moment and in the now of <laughs> everything isn't, it's just nothing's going well. And I'm, and I'm so concerned. And I'm, and I'm really worried because he, like, I, I heard recently, he had such a bad week. And I mm. go, what does that mean? <laughs> like, you mean there was some dysregulation, there was a, a little bit of stress with the ex expectations too high, too high. What did it mean that a three and a half year old had a bad week? <laughs> like, or, or they got a piece of paper that came home with lots of sad faces and red ink on it, you know, w which is heartbreaking because, you know, kids internalize that a, ki a kid is given, imagine, imagine going any place on a daily basis and, and, you know, every uh, hour that you did something, having to fill it out in a different color to show that you didn't do so good, you didn't meet our expectation, and then to have to carry it home. I don't know how many behavior sheets that uh, we got home when my son was very young that were crumbled up or had been ripped up. And it's like, well, of course, right. you know, uh, the, the burden that we put on children sometimes is can be immense. And it affects, you know, I, I was having a conversation with a family member recently that uh, had a, uh, a, a younger daughter uh, in first grade who was beginning to say, I'm a bad kid. I'm a bad kid. Mm -hmm. because That was a message coming home. Um, what a burden, you know, that we, we put on kids. And it's so interesting you say that because I've heard that too. I've, I've, I've worked with um, a little guy who was suspended from kindergarten. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Um, and something that he said was along the lines of what you mentioned. And it was more like, I'm not very good at being a kid. Right. And like that, that if that doesn't get you, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what will like he, that's how he felt throughout right. the school year. I'm not good at being a kid. I don't know what's happening. And this is something that I can't control. I don't know. He's like, I don't know. My brain just told me to do it. So I did. It. <laughs> oh my gosh. You, you know, I mean, that, that's that statement. Um, my son, when he was very young and we would ask him, that was exactly what he said. I don't know. My brain told me to do it, you know, or my brain, my brain made me do it. That's mm -hmm. what he would say. And, and there was a lot more insight into that, that yeah. comment. than uh, I appreciate it for probably another, you know, 15 years. Um, but I mean, it really is meaningful when you kind of hear people that, you know, thinking about things that way. Um, so tell me more, you know, so of course the, the name of your, um, you know, consulting is, is play to learn. So tell me more about, you know, of course, there are lots of different approaches out there um, in terms of working with and supporting kids. And many of them, as you've kind of identified already, um, focus on what I believe are the wrong things. They focus on the behavior. They focus on um, changing uh, behavior uh, versus really understanding, you know, why somebody's having a hard time, what's getting in their way. Um, they're often very compliance based. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about compliance and, and there's some real dangers in all of that. So, I mean, there are a lot of different approaches out there. Um, you know, there are other approaches like DIR and floor time and, uh, yep. you know, okay. <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about kind of your approach and how play factors into that. Um, that's why I was, I said, I was like really just lucky to be trained and mentored by, in, in the floor time methodology. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've 
I've taken with me. And over the years, I've became certified in family trauma and certified in ADHD. And those are the areas where I'm looking for a strength based approach. Mm -hmm. And we're figuring out like, what is the child's intention? So we're, I'm also working from the, there's this intent an intentionality model that looks at the basic underpinnings of language. Plus we're looking at effort and we're looking at engagement because when a task takes a lot of effort, then other, other things have to almost like fall to the wayside. Mm -hmm. And when we look at how much effort any small problem solving task takes, then we're going, oh, by the end of this, you know, my sessions are 50 minutes. By the end of, of this 50 minute session, no wonder the child is yawning <laughs> or mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. no wonder. And I tell them like, either your, your kid's going to be hungry or they're going to be tired mm -hmm. because their brain has worked so hard right. Right. for, for this, if in this time, and it's, when you look at it from the outside, it's, oh, they're just playing. <laughs> like, what can be so hard about that? And this is where the learning co part comes in is we're I'm really looking at, okay, here's what the kid is good at. And now how do I encourage and nudge a little bit farther? Like, how do I make them? And we talk about like positive stress a little bit, right? How do I sprinkle in that those tidbits of positive stress to then build up their resilience. Mm -hmm. And those are the moments that we we capitalize on. And in the beginning, I also make those connections for for kids. So let's say it's been, you know, six months. And I say, you know, when we first started, and you couldn't work out that marble run, do you remember that the whole thing came crashing down and you threw one across the room. <laughs> I go, did you just realize that today um, it was a little tough and you actually talked yourself through it? And then the kids go, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> like they've been doing it forever. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, I, I want to hit a couple comments here real quick. Um, but but I, I love, you know, I mean, you know, again, I mean, you know, uh, I'm a huge believer that... Um, you know, to connect with anybody, we need to relate with them. And it's not, it's not a matter of, you know, um, pretending that we relate to them. It's actually taking the time to, to forge a relationship that uh, they feel valued. And, and, you know, if we really want to access the, the thinking part of their brain, you know, getting them comfortable, getting them uh, in a position that they feel valued. I mean, you know, I think, I think there's a whole lot of value. I mean, uh, to that, type of approach, even the kind of the, the floor time type of approach of, of, of connecting, you know, the, the connection piece, uh, a couple of comments here real quick. Uh, Chantel, who's actually one of our uh, volunteers in Canada. So uh, said hello from New Brunswick. Uh, Cass said again, rewards are super kind of productive. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, let's see. Cass shared uh, our three-year-old daughter, robust high-tech AAC increased her sense of felt safety incredibly. Uh, the largest impact for her has been regulation, uh, which has then flowed into many benefits regarding skills development and fun, social engagement. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's amazing what happens, uh, you know, when you feel safe. It's amazing what happens uh, when you are regulated. You know, uh, sometimes the focus is on downstream building the skill or ability where when we go upstream and we focus on safety, we focus on regulation. These things can naturally begin to emerge. Uh, so there's so much potential there. Uh, Michelle uh, said that uh, uh, her and her, let's see, she said that they're excited to be wearing their Alliance Against Inclusion Restraining Shirt today for a news interview regarding our special education system in Nebraska. Uh, Michelle also mentioned, as we were talking about the, the harm done to children, that her son in the fifth grade wanted to kill himself. I mean, you know, the um, when we are always looking through a deficit mindset and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of kind of the social model of disability over the, the medical model. You know, it's not about deficit. It's not about fixing. It's not about you're broken. It's about you're different. We're all, we're all different. We all have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different, um, you know, abilities and different strengths, but, um, you know, so often it's the focus is on the deficit and even very young kids bring these things home. Uh, let's see, Devana said, Oh my God, the, uh, sad faces my son got after kindergarten uh, he started sobbing and said, at six years old, I just want to be a normal kid. 
Uh, I hugged him and told his uh, therapist this, to which he replied, you shouldn't have hugged him. Oh, gosh. Um, because that was some kind of uh, reward, right? That was, <laughs> uh, well, you know, and we hear that. We hear that all the time. Yes. You know, that connection is necessary. Connection is necessary to help, uh, especially a dysregulated kid who's having a hard time. Uh, yet people uh, are so focused on the consequence that you providing connection is seen as a reinforcer when it's not. Right. It, it's, you know, the only way that we are capable of learning is to be regulated. We do not learn when we're in dysregulated states. So uh, to, to begin throwing consequences at anyone who is dysregulated is not the way to, to begin to help them. I mean, uh, I'm a firm believer that ultimately discipline is really about teaching. It's not about providing consequences or, or rewards. It's about, hey, how do we help somebody to develop the skills, the abilities, you know, the ability to regulate whatever it may be, but so much of this happens. Uh, and then, and you, yes. And you brought a, di a discipline. So the root of it is a disciple. Right. Like yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's to learn. It's, it's the follow. It's the, yep. uh, yeah, no, uh, Lori Desitels had uh, made mention of that in connections over compliance or book. And that yes. really stuck with me. Like, <laughs> I know. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I read I'm, that cover to cover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, in fact, we're doing a book study right now on her um, newer book, um, yes. Intentional Neuroplasticity, which is a, another great book. Uh, let's see what else we have here. I just want to see what other comments there are. Um, uh, Cass said during an intake appointment with an OT for my daughter a couple of years ago, I vividly remember the OT remark. Uh, that she has never had a parent be able to list more than two strengths uh, due to medical deficit model uh, we all have to navigate. Yeah, and that's that's really unfortunate because, you know, um, I think so much comes good from our perceptions and views of our children as well. I mean, uh, you know, I've always, um, you know, I mean, I have two children, but and, and they're both amazing kids that I'm very proud of and you know, they both have had things that have been challenging, but different does not make less. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so often, you know, kind of that deficit mindset leads even people that are there to advocate for kids feeling bad about their kids. And it's hard. It's hard when you're a parent and your child is the one that's having difficulty. Um, but that's why people need support and need to, you know, be able to work with professionals like yourself that are, are there to help. Um, and it's a really great point because I remember having a conversation with a dad and I said, the way that you see her is exactly the way that she's going to continue showing up. Mm -hmm. Like that's exactly the way that she's going to continue showing up because that's the way that you see her. So mm -hmm. if you want her to change the way she's showing up, then let's change the way that you see her. Right, right, right. Well, you know, I, I think back to that example of uh, the, the, the child that comes home with the, uh, the negative behavior chart that then is further punished by the parents um, because they had a bad day. Um, and the expectations and the uh, things sometimes that we do to children, uh, you would never think about doing to another adult. Uh, yeah. I.e. I, 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 a clip chart, you know, where we have a, a chart in the front of the room that if you're having a hard time, you've got to go move your clip. I can't imagine a workplace that we're to implement something like that. Uh, you know, people would be probably leaving quickly uh, for good reason. Uh, a couple more comments here. Uh, Cass said, and, and I don't remember the context of when this came out, but, uh, uh, but is that really about intentionally building resilience or just the effect of increased regulation? Uh, it's both. I, okay. It, it's both because it's the intent it's of building resilience and the focus is on regulation. Do you ever feel, you know, I feel this way sometimes, but um, resilience strikes me in two ways. Um, like, in my, in my perfect mindset here of the perfect world, uh, I want a world where we don't have to be as resilient. You know, meaning that there's a lot of things we ask kids to be resilient about that we need to stop doing, you know, and, and how do we, so, and I agree. I mean, you know, we need a certain degree of, of resilience, right? Because uh, everything is not always going to go uh, in a perfect world scenario. But, uh, you know, I also wonder how we balance that because I hear a lot of things in regards to uh, trauma. And, and mm -hmm. of course, I'm always that, upstream person saying, well, how do we avoid getting here? Like, you know, back to the, the quote from Desmond Tutu about, you know, um, rather than pulling people out of the river, let's go upstream and figure out why they're falling in. Um, does, do you ever get struck by that? Or do you, do you have anything to help me balance that, that thought of, you know, uh, how do we, 
how do, how do we, you know, get away from doing harm um, and not just, you know, lean towards the resiliency that we all have and even things like, uh, you know, neuroplasticity. I mean, it's great that we can create new pathways, but how do we focus on creating less harm? I think it's more about figuring out how do I handle a little bit of struggle right. and everybody has that little bit of struggle. It's just the lens that you're looking at it through where, um, you know, I read like Angela Duckworth's grit, right? Like mm -hmm. such a great, such a, such a great work where like, how do we build like grittier kids? Right? Right, right. Like it, it's just, it's that just right, like challenge where yeah. it's not too easy and it's not too hard. And that's where it's, the little bit of struggle of how do I figure it out in a different way? Mm -hmm. And how do I look at this problem, not from a fixed mindset, but from a growth mindset? Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, no, I, no, I hear you for sure. Um, I just, you know, my heart breaks for a lot of the kids that, you know, we know have a significant amount of trauma. And, and quite frankly, I mean, when we look at disability, uh, there's a lot traumatizing about how, you know, kids are pathologized and, and treated. Uh, and, and, and those are areas where it's like, we as the adults have such a responsibility to do better and avoid, you know, uh, and again, you know, realizing that there are some areas where we definitely need some resilience. But, uh, you know, I just hope that we can continue to do better as a world in the way we treat people. And, and you know, resilience, while important, always to a degree, is not of as important course. for things like traumatic stress and, and right. you know, the mistreatment of people. Uh, a couple of comments here. Uh, Rose Rosa said, can you please make an example of letting the child endure a little bit of stress? Sure. Um, it's the example I gave of like a, a puzzle piece not working and not fitting and I don't jump to just fix it. Or if a we're putting train tracks together and one of them fell apart and I'm looking at the parent from the corner of my eye, jumping to fix it, to put it back together. And I go, hold on, like, let's see how this plays out. And that is that little bit of stress of, oh, I just put this track together. I worked so hard and the whole thing just came crashing down and we go, you're right. It's so much hard work. It is. And then right. like you sit there just for a little bit to figure out like what's going to be the next move instead of right away jumping into jumping into fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and it's also, it's less about, I'm not saying that, you know, like kids are resilient, they'll get over it. They have to, they just have right. to learn and go with it. Right. It's more right. like you really have to dig into the science mm -hmm. of resilience right. and like where that comes from. And it really comes from here's the train track that fell mm -hmm. apart so that, the child learns that they don't necessarily have to fall apart with it. Like in the right, beginning, right, right, right. maybe that's something that might be the case because they don't have mm -hmm. the skills to go, Oh, it's not quite a big deal. Right. right? So right, right. I don't tell them that it's a big, that it's not a big deal because it is a big deal. Right. In this moment, like it's the biggest deal ever for this four year old that the train, he worked so hard to put together it crashed and something fell apart. And like, mm -hmm. there's that little bit of stress and we go, all right, like now what do we do? And sometimes those tracks go flying across the room and we right, go, right. all right, well, it looks like putting it back together today is so super tough. Like let's, let's figure out like where we're going from here. And mm -hmm. oftentimes it's even it's without words. Like it's not that I'm, using all of these explanations with a three or a four year old and even even older, right? Sometimes it's like silence, that's, that's golden, <laughs> where it's just taking a moment. And if you don't know what to say, and I tell parents all the time, if you don't know what to say, don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. like, give, you, give yourself a moment, give your kid a moment, and then figure out how, how you can step in and support. Mm -hmm. right? so that's really what we're working for and mm -hmm. figuring out like in the beginning, yes, you might need a lot of support, which is mm -hmm. great. And we're mm -hmm. going to give you all of that support. Okay. So now how do we figure out to pull back that support just a little bit? Mm -hmm. right? Like just so that the kids don't feel like the rug has been pulled out from under them. Right. Or I'm not 
throwing them into the deep right. end of the right. pool right. when they haven't learned how to swim and go, you'll be fine. Right. right? right. Like right. you're resilient. You'll learn right. how to swim. Like that's not what we're doing. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. And, and of course it gets back to what you said earlier, which is, you know, um, I mean, there are absolutely different kinds of stress and, and, and there is healthy stress. I mean, healthy stress, uh, you know, uh, keeps us moving throughout our day and, and doing things that we've uh, obligated ourselves to do. Uh, and then of course there's, there's uh, unhealthy and there's chronic and there's toxic stress uh, and there's trauma and there's a, a lot of things in between. But uh, you know, I mean, it is important that there is a, you know, there is healthy stress and uh, you know, those are things that are pushing us sometimes in uh, directions. I want, there was a follow-up to that. I'm going to skip to it real quick, just because we've got this thread going and uh, Rose, uh, Rosa said, so what if the child has a meltdown or hurts themselves? You know, how do you avoid it? And I guess kind of from what you said to, you know, okay, well, um, yeah. And what I heard was kind of the process of this, right? Um, you know, you want to ultimately help people develop skills and ability. Yes. Um, and of course, you know, you, well, let, let me, let me not talk for you. Let me let you talk and, and uh, address it. Well, we can't avoid every meltdown. Right. And it's not about avoiding it. It's about working through it. And in the beginning, maybe it might take 40 minutes. And like you're just you're there even without like like I said, without language, you're just you're there to support. And we of course don't want kids hurting themselves. And like there's a very compassionate way to like slowly put a hand down or go like, yep, you're right. It's really hard. Like I'm right here, like for whatever you need. And you could say I'm right here with, with language, or you could say I'm right here just by where your body positioning is. And like how you, I'm always turning myself toward the kids. Mm -hmm. I'm not turning myself away, like re regardless of, of what's happening for them. And then they see that like, Oh, this, this place is safe. And my relationship is not contingent on how well I right. do, right? right? Like right. that's the right. biggest piece, right? Like, yeah. so my relationship with every single, you know, child who I see is not contingent on like doing well, because that, what right. does that really mean? <laughs> right. Right. Right? Right. right, So, and the way that they show up, that's where the therapy goes. Right. So right. it's not really about, it's not about the activity. It's about right. how they're coming in. And if I'm sensing that dysregulation, whatever I had in mind, that's done. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're focusing on regulating first, regardless of how long that takes. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I have a tendency, um, having had the, um, kind of opportunity to, uh, work with, learn from, um, and, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, be in the, the same, uh, orbit as some people that just are amazing, doing amazing work and have great ideas. So I, I tend to blend things in my head. And, and, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, well, you know, that that moment that, you know, the, the child becomes a bit dysregulated, um, you know, there's an opportunity for, for co-regulation. There's an opportunity yeah. to strengthen uh, a relationship. You know, I also think a lot about uh, because I've been focused a lot on Lori's work lace, recently, Lori Desitels, and, you know, the opportunity uh, at some point to um, work with children and, and teach them their feelings and sensations when they begin to feel dysregulated. And, you know, hopefully at some point, not only are you helping kids develop skills, but an awareness of their internal feelings and perceptions yep. to, you know, help them in the future, you know, navigate some of those really difficult times. So, you know, it, all, all of this is, uh, you know, certainly complicated, but I think the thing you say that's so important is my, you know, your, your relationship is not dependent on their success. You know, um, and I think a lot of our behavioral driven approaches seem to equate uh, the connection with the compliance, you know, that that if you don't meet this expectation, you don't get this thing from me. And that can be so damaging uh, to anyone, quite frankly. Right. Um, we've got a couple other we've got a lot of, of comments here. So I'm going to try to get to a few others here. Uh, and let's see what we have here. Um, and, and this was, yeah, there was another one here from Rose, which kind of is in the vein of what I was talking about and what happens during those moments. How do you support regulation? So, I mean, what's your approach when, when a kid clearly has become dysregulated, what do you do to kind of help them in that moment to regain regulation? So you could eventually get back to their, you know, uh, their ability to kind of think rationally about things. 
Right. Well, in, in order for them to, it's like you said, in order for them to self-regulate, I have to be the co-regulator. Right? So all, all expectations are pushed to the side mm -hmm. and it's just really them knowing that it's, it is a safe space. And like, there's no, it's not that there there's wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And, and yes. And sometimes I saw another comment that said like, 40 minutes in distress sounds like a really long time. I'm not doing it's not, I'm not causing it on purpose. Right, it's, right, it's right, right. Something that didn't go quite right, right in right. in this child's mind. There's, you know, there's uh, a young girl who I, I work with who I'm, I'm thinking about. And it's because she, the approach that she was used to before would be, well, this is what you could earn, right? Like, let's just right, come right. out of this as quickly as right. possible. And what's happening now, and I've been with her for almost three you know, three years is that when something doesn't go according to plan, she goes, all right. Oh, well, like that. Oh, well, took time. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that that it, it took it took building and it took effort from like her trust and, you know, the parents trusting in in the process itself. Right. So I'm there. I'm there to support and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm there to guide and I'm going, OK, let's shut down all the lights, like let's remove any type of extraneous stimuli. Um, I know a lot of what helps. I have these like really cool, like they're called nuggets. They're just giant cushions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like we build, <laughs> we, we like build little homes for ourselves mm -hmm. and we go in there, I go in there with them. So it's mm -hmm. not, it's like, let's just shut out everything else. And I'm just going to sit here with you. And I've had, mm -hmm. and then, the comments that I've heard from it's, other kids sitting with can mean so much. Yes. It's yeah. sitting with, and then right. the, and the comments that I've heard is I really like it here. And I go, mm -hmm. great. I like it here with you too. And then it's like, all right. And we just sit in silence <laughs> mm -hmm. because that's what's helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right. There was a comment about like getting a drink of water. I always have my water bottle in all my sessions because okay. that's like, and, and, and that's the modeling piece of something is getting like really frustrating and really overwhelming. And I'll sit back and I'll, I'll take my water bottle and I'm, and I'm going, um, just give me one sec. Or okay. uh, when you talked about like kids understanding their own like internal sensations, um, there was, I, I wound up like walking into one of the therapy rooms and without, I, I opened up a window and one of the kids who I've been with, he's been with me for a while. He goes, Oh, were you feeling kind of hot? And I was like, wow. Um, yeah, I was like, that's me getting dysregulated. Right. So I said, you know, you're right. Like my body was feeling kind of hot and to help it, I decided to open the window mm -hmm. and I always go like, does that work for you? And he's like, yep, that works for me. <laughs> like, Great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay, a couple more comments here. We have uh, uh, Devona saying uh, yes, teaching and through play and relationship. Uh, uh, Cass had, a, I think, an important point here. Cass said, uh, I'm autistic an adult, and hearing professionals say that they're working on resilience intentionally makes me deeply uncomfortable because autistic people's experience uh, resilience building encounters constantly. Uh, and, and I think, and, and you know, um, you know, when I read this, and, and I don't want to get wrong, and Cash, you can tell me if I do, but um, one of the things I think that we sometimes see, and, uh, you know, I'm sure you probably have as well, is, I hate to say this, but but people intentionally trying to put somebody in a position where they're distressed. I mean, I've even heard um, behavioral folks uh, going into classrooms saying, well, let me show you what happens when you wind them up, and, and, and literally, you know, causing kids to be distressed. Um, and, and what I'm hearing, I think from what you're talking about is you're not talking about intentionally, uh, you know, creating situations that, you know, th that they will need to build resilience. You're talking through play, through normal things that there are things that emerge that, um, are opportunities. Uh, am I hearing that right? And can, yes. can you address that a little more? And I, and I hear, I absolutely hear the, the concern there from, uh, Cass, because I think that's something specifically, I mean, when we look at. Uh, some of the uh, models of therapy, specifically around autism, and we look at ABA and we look at compliance-based approaches, there's a lot that is not mindful of the individual's experience. Um, so I think right. anytime there's like, oh, you're, you're doing this intentionally to, in, well, no. I, but anyway, let, let me let you kind of address that. And and it's also, it's I've heard ABA also used for with ADHD. Like it's, right. 
<laughs> it, it's rearing in, uh, in, in a few, in a few areas. Right, right. Um, and I've heard like comment and actually like written into IEPs planned ignoring. And I go, hold on. Right, <laughs> like, right, 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 right. What are you, what's going on? So, so like that, right. that, that, that would be quite traumatic, right? Where it's right. like, I'm having a tough time and they're planning to ignore me right. instead of figuring out how to help. Right. And I'm coming from the viewpoint of like support is going, it, it, it really depends, right? It, there's no, there's no like black and white answer where like in this situation, this is the only thing you can do. And in situation B, like the, this is the only approach. It's so important to figure out like what works for each child and what works for each family. Mm-hmm. And it still comes back to that building relationships and building trust. And that, and that's like, that's really where we start. Right, right, um, right, like right. If, if we have that trusting relationship and like when we have that trusting relationship and you're, if you're, you're having like a really hard moment, I'm still here. Right, right, right. Like, Absolutely. Regardless, re- Absolutely. like regardless of what it is, like I'm still here. And then we both come out the other side going, my gosh, that was tough. Right. Like that, that was really hard back there. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and, and I think even making that realization, and and this is, I mean, again, you know, we, we, we've got uh, a lot of people here that are probably listening today that I would say are kind of in the choir here in terms of um, having a lot of the same concerns and, and passion uh, around the things that are that are being done that are, are not working for kids. But, you know, so often, you know, I think people frame things um, as kids intentionally doing things. And, of course, you know, when you really get into the, the science now that's available, we know that not all behavior is intentional. We know that our brains are not fully developed over 25 or 30 years old, uh, you know, but yet you can find uh, people looking through a certain lens that will say, oh, gee, uh, you know, this, this child was manipulating, this child was, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm not a big proponent of the uh, traditional approach and functions of behavior, uh, right. which I think often are not taking into account kind of that bottom up or nervous system driven uh, behavior. Uh, And and there's this tendency to look at, you know, rather than saying, Hey, this is a kid that's having a hard time. People saying, this is a kid that's giving me a hard time. And sometimes that's not, this is just simply not the truth. I mean, uh, this is somebody that's having a hard time and, and kids need our help. Uh, I think uh, Cass also mentioned like modeling, you know, and and those are of course things you could do, I, I guess in the, in the moment when you're doing something like play therapy and that happens, um, you know, the modeling opportunity might be over at that point. Uh, but, but I'm sure that modeling is part of what you do, uh, on a, on a, especially when you begin working and building relationships, uh, there's probably a bit of parallel things happening at first as trust is being built and, you know, all these things are happening. Um, but ignore, I, I couldn't agree with you more on ignoring plan. The whole mm-hmm. idea behind plan ignoring, um, really, I mean, you know, these are very often moments where, an individual needs connection more than any other time. Yes. And, and yet the response is ignoring. And uh, uh, we had a comment here, you know, just as bad as rewards and consequences. Uh, I would say perhaps even worse. Right. Uh, you know, I think that uh, when you um, take away that human connection, the, the damage that can be done there is so profound. Because then you're leaving the child to handle things on their own when right. they clearly can't. Because... Right. Like you said, right? Like if they would, they could, and right. they're in this moment. They 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 clearly can. So it is when they need us the most, and it mm-hmm. is like goes back to how we show up and uh, how we re- how we remain in that moment with them. Right, 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 right. And, and as they be, you know, and, and all these things that are true of children are true of anyone, right? I mean, we we all have bad days and need to co-regulate. Uh, you know, we all can become dysregulated at times. And in those moments, you know, I, you know, I always say this when I, when I talk about this, but you know, when we're dysregulated, we say we do things that we later regret because our thinking brain was not online at that Mm -hmm. moment in time. Um, you know, so it's difficult. I see a follow up here, um, from Cass and just as, uh, my comment was also regarding the common withdrawal or refusal of accommodations and co-regulation due to helping the child build resilience. Yeah. Uh, and I hear you. And, and, and I'm not at all, uh, you know, a, a supporter of, 
right. intentionally, um, you know, removing accommodations or, um, you know, just, okay, well, they, they have to the tough this out. You know, it's a process, you know? Yes. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, so tell me more about some of the other things that you do. So one of the things that I remember talking to you about uh, at the time was feeding and mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, this came up for me. Um, you know, of course, you know, we focus on a lot of things and as I've said, kind of broadly, it's, it's often the many things that are done to people under the umbrella of behavior. Uh, one of the things that came to my attention was uh, children actually being restrained and force fed. Um, and uh, I had a colleague that had been doing research and, uh, doing some writing on that subject area. And, you know, uh, some of this was happening uh, through um, ABA providers, mm -hmm. uh, which of course uh, aren't necessarily specialized in that area. Um, and it was kind of disturbing to hear that, that some of these things were happening, but you've got some, some background in that area as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. So I look at mealtime as a gathering and that's what we are really working on, like figuring out how we can bring that back right? because the families that come, the mealtime is one of the most stressful experiences that they've had or continue to have. And it could be for a variety of reasons. And when we focus on like what the purpose is of the meal and why I pose that as a question, like the parents are always saying, well, I never thought about it in that way. And we forgot the reason that we come together anyway, like whether it's everybody's on their phones or like kids are eating in front of like in front of iPads, because like, that's just the way to get them to eat. Right. And one of the things I say is that your child isn't eating for you, they're eating for themselves. So I'm not here to get your child to eat for you. And they're also not eating for me. Like they're eating for themselves. And it's that recognition that's part of the work that, that I do. Um, I've heard with behavior approaches where it's, well, they'll get a preferred food if they have this like three right. bites of this non-preferred. And I go, okay, I'm going to drop you in a foreign country <laughs> and something you've never seen before that has... I don't know, like scales, I'm going to go, you eat that. And once you eat it, I'll give you a cookie, right? Like you're already, and it goes back to you, the nervous system, right? Like flooded, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Such an alarm state. And then what happens is your appetite drops anyway, because like your body doesn't need to digest anything. So your digestive system goes offline. And then all of a sudden it's, well, I'm not hungry anymore because you're not because right. you're in this highly stressful situation where right, somebody's right, telling right, you right. in order to get that really good thing, right. you have to eat this really bad thing. <laughs> right. So, because if we're just dis dysregulated, digestion is inhibited. So yes. yeah, that, that's really, I, I never thought about that before, but that's really interesting. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it, it goes back to like individual profiles, right? And the other mindset is like, how do we get kids really comfortable around different foods? Mm -hmm. Because if we don't show it to them and they won't know what it is. <laughs> so like, and there's no such thing. And I say, oh, there's no such thing as like, this is kid food. This is adult food. Like right. food is just food. Right? There's, there's like, yes, kid menus exist in restaurants, but like there's no such thing because if you look at the at a kid's menu, I wouldn't eat any of that. Like, why would you serve it to a child? Like, it's the it, it, I refer to it as like the beige diet. Like everything on that kid menu is beige. Chicken nuggets and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. French fries, mac and cheese, yep, yep. plain pasta. Yep, yep. Like it's just it's all beige. It's all like one. My one my, my daughter was a beige eater for many years, um, and, and it's funny because my son was always really adventuresome uh, when he was very young. Um, like his favorite, and it's just because we would try a lot of different things, and and they were there available. But he was into like uh, Maryland crab dip and fried oysters. You know, I mean, you know, the, the kid at seven years old was a really expensive dinner, uh, uh, you know, date. And my, my daughter was for a long time and she's gotten much more adventuresome, but you know, I mean, there, there are families that have real difficulty around feeding. And of course, yes. you know, the, I, I would assume the more 
the more you the the more stress that's created by the situation, uh, the more reluctant somebody may be that's already having difficulty. Um, so I'm sure that's a really difficult um, position. It is. And somebody just made a comment about ARFID. Like I love working with kids with ARFID because it's so complex and um, they are, it's, they're like such amazing and like sensitive kids. And ARFID is also, there's a mindset piece with ARFID because there's an anxiety component. Um, yeah. I, I like, I, lo I love that comment and you, it's, it goes back to regulation, right? right. Like all roads lead back to regulation right. and figuring out like, how do you co-regulate at the table? And sometimes it's bringing up comments like you're so right right now, like food is hard. Like, yeah, food is, I, there was, <laughs> there's a, a three and a half year old who's new to the practice who um, we made like potatoes with him. And he goes, these potatoes are too hard. And we go, and there's never an expectation that like whatever we make that there's no have to ever mm -hmm. like there's no such thing of like you have to touch it or like you have to like you have to lick it like I don't even know where that came from right like there's no there's never a have to it's just it's all it's all exploratory and again like yes it depends on the age and yet it still goes back to to regulation because when you see a child start to get dysregulated during the meal it's it go you're you know or like i know that this has just become too tough like we we have to pull back mm -hmm. right and and it goes back to like we're not building resilience with food right mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like you're starting to notice moments of dysregulation where like if the child's like already getting a little bit more hesitant and you go, you know what, like, it looks like this is getting really hard. Uh, let me help you out. And like, sometimes you have to just push things off to the side and like move on to just a different conversation. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, and it's not all of a sudden you feel the ease, like there's just this, this sigh of relief and you hear it like you hear the you hear the sigh of the of, of relief from the child and like their their body changes and they want they want to you know like stay at the table whether they're serving mom or like they're serving me because when we have a mealtime experience I tell parents to come hungry because I was like everybody's eating <laughs> like doesn't mean like the child has to but like we all are because that's where the modeling comes in right mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we have to you know, it's not like we like everything. Right, and, right, right. and and that's where the, the relationship building comes in. I like such a such a huge relationship building. And especially for older kids who've had, unfortunately, like other experiences, and they come in really hesitant. The first thing I tell them is that like, I will never tell you that you have to have something like mm -hmm. you will never feel that you must have something because that's not how your relationship with food works. Like we're it we're going to be we're going to be learning, and mm -hmm. there are some days that you're going to be really curious, and other days that you're going to want to pull back. It's all good. Like, and it goes back to my relationship with you is not contingent on whether or not you eat. Right, 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 because right. Because right. it goes back to we haven't touched on this yet, and like we can't. It goes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right, right, right. Like. Safety comes first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> so, so you know, thinking about um, uh, Cass's situation, um, you know, of course, the recommendation was ABA, and um, uh, you know, I, I can't say I know uh, everything in the world to know about it, but I can say that I've heard some pretty bad stories uh, about you know the you know uh, you know non preferred preferred foods force feeding kids, uh, a, a lot of things that are alarming to me. Uh, and, and I can only think the kinds of potential for eating disorders a child might have mm -hmm. as, as they grow. Um, but if you look at that situation where she was said like, here it is intensive ABA, that's what we recommend. Um, and of course you, you offer this as, as a, a service, but is there something else you would point a parent to like somebody that just was watching this? Is there, is there a book? Is there a ideology? Is there, uh, is there any other, are there any other resources you might point people to, uh, to explore options other than uh, kind of ABA uh, based approaches? Yeah. So there's the get permission Institute. Okay. Um, it's a great, it's, it's a, it's a, it's about like a permissive relationship when it comes to food. Um, I think okay. that's a really great starting point.
Okay. Um, that that's that that's where that's where I would go because it actually builds on that's part of the reason that I mentioned like Maslow's hierarchy is because there's one for food also. Okay. And okay. in order for and like with 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 Maslow's hierarchy, right? At the tippy top, it's self actualization. Right. right. Okay. And for for kids who struggle with food, at the tippy top is a a new food that's now in their repertoire. Right. So it's like that's at the very top. So how do we get there? Bottom up. Like we build, we build safety, we build understanding. We have like they're called like it's it's Marsha Dunn Klein. She calls it like food rehearsals, where like, oh, like th- th- this is a rehearsal. Like the food is showing up and like maybe it's the star of the show. And when the child comes to the table, the always is there's always something that they're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Because imagine coming to the table, looking at things that are at the table and saying, there's nothing here for me. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I can't, I can't have any of this. Mm-hmm. And then that gets you to now, I don't feel good. And mm-hmm. now I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good right. about, and it goes back to like, make a good choice about what you're eating. Like, right, what does right, that mean? Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. What are those? Right, right. So we are they fall into the strap of like healthy versus unhealthy, yeah, right? Or yeah. like things that are good for you versus things that aren't or like earning dessert, right? Like not something that we earn. And I've had to say that. I was like, well, actually we don't work for food here. <laughs> it just comes. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right, right. No, that's great. That's great. Um, another point that uh, uh, Cass brought up, which I think is a great intersectional point is she brought up, this is where high tech robust AAC has been so helpful in our household, building shared meaningful sensory vocabulary around food, plus increased uh, felt safety due to increased ability to communicate. Uh, I'm just kind of curious, um, in your work, uh, both through, I mean, well, through all of your work, um, how, how does uh, AAC uh, tie into your work? And I mean, obviously the ability to uh, have, I mean, there are so many individuals, uh, you know, non-speaking or, or limited uh, speaking ability, um, who are, you know, chronically um, underestimated, undervalued, you know, people have very low expectations. Uh, you know, of course that feeds into a whole, um, um, you know, the problems that we were talking about before of, of self-worth and all of that. How, how does AAC factor into the work that you do professionally? So I am very happy to say I'm not an expert in AAC. You'd have to find mm. somebody who like really specializes in augmented eventual communication mm. to then like work hand in hand with, let's say like the language that I would provide and mm. the therapeutic techniques that I would provide. Um, and that's just like, it's really great that, you know, this family has found their, their own route. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm very comfortable to say that like, that's, I don't specialize in, in that right, area. Right, right, um, sure. So like I'm, I'm here working on how do we establish a food relationship? And right, right, right. we also, I also talk to kids and families about like the power of yet, right? Like, mm. oh, we're like, this is gross. I go, oh, you don't know it yet. Okay. Yep. Got it. Right, like right. this food is new. You don't like, you're not really sure about it just yet. Okay. Right. It, it'll stay here. Right. Or like, the my parents I don't eat that I don't like that that's not my food like my food is over here and your food is over there and it's breaking that divide of my food versus your food so it becomes our right Mm -hmm. like we are having dinner together and it's it's something so interesting that I do a six-week program on uh meal it's called like the path to mealtime freedom Mm -hmm. for for families and we start and it's really like me helping them work and walking them through my entire process and what the families that we had a cohort just finished, what the families came away from was one of them was the concept of a gathering and really enjoying, like one of the dads had said, we're having a great time at dinner. Like, I don't remember the last time we put the devices down. Like there's no, there's no need for them. We're actually talking. And I go, how great is that? Like you're having, and then within those conversations, that's when like, if in the back of your mind, if you're having, all right, how do I introduce Mm -hmm. something new to the table? It comes up because it's an, it's like play, right? It's it's a natural progression. 
And then we go into breaking the divide between like, this is my food and this is your food. Mm -hmm. Because the important part of that is then you finally get kids saying, oh, what are we having for dinner instead of what are you going to make for me? Mm-hmm. It becomes more of, of a we process, like, what are we having for dinner tonight? And then they know and they trust that, like, whatever they feel safe with still, that food is going to be there. And then there's like this new rehearsal of something new that shows up. And then maybe it shows up again in a few days, just so that there's comfort in, oh, this new thing isn't as scary as it used to be. Now I'm getting really curious about it. Like, I wonder what would happen Mm -hmm. if I, and this is like all internal for the child. Like, I wonder what would happen if I have some, oh, this is interesting. And then I tell the parents like to party on the inside, (laughs) right? Because like, we're talking that like, you want to say like, oh my gosh, right? Like you tried this, it was so great. And then what happens if the uh, the next day they can't, right? Does that mean like they're not getting the same response? So mm-hmm. it's, and, and their their acceptance is love and not conditional upon yeah 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 no, yes I, I, exactly yeah. exactly right, right, so then right. I say like you the re, the response is you respond as if it's been happening forever you go mm-hmm. oh cool you had a piece of salmon all right sounds good to me and then like have a party on the inside or like send me an email and then we'll rejoice in it together I, I feel because... like that needs to be a t-shirt you know have a party on the inside have a party on the inside. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, listen, we we have gotten to about our time, and and, and uh, I, I try to stick to our uh, our schedule here. So we are uh, at our time, but I just wanted to see, uh, and and the time always goes by so quickly, right? I know. Um, you know, I think, oh, uh, you know, an hour, and you you look, and you're 45 minutes in. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share as we kind of close things out today? Any other uh, kind of final uh, thoughts or um, ideas that you'd like to share with our um, audience today? Um, I think it's, it goes back to safety and relationships. And that's like really where we want to build from and understanding like each child's unique perspective. And that's where, like, th- that's where we, we should live. <laughs> really. Safe, safety and connection, right? I mean, there, there's so much potential, you know, once you get there. Well, listen, it's been uh, really great uh, having this conversation with you, and uh, I hope you had as much fun as I did. I always have a lot <laughs> yeah. of fun having these conversations, and I think we have uh, a lot of our... We actually had a very engaged audience that was here for most of the uh, the show here. I've, there were people that were here from the beginning to the end, uh, so uh, certainly a lot of interest. Uh, we could probably have you back just to dive in on the uh, the feeding a little bit more. Oh, I, yeah, well. <laughs> yep, <laughs> we yep. can. Yeah. Uh, and of course you do, you do talks and you do uh, training as well. Yes. Uh, we've shared a link to your website there so people can, uh, touch base with you if they have any, any further questions or, or want to touch base. Uh, and it looks like Courtney has just shared that up as well on our screen. <laughs> so, uh, thank you again for, uh, spending some time with us today. And I want to thank our audience, uh, who has been, uh, here with us, uh, watching live. And if you're watching after the fact, hope you enjoyed it as well. And again, you have all the contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or want to learn more about uh, training or any of that. So with that, I will say goodbye to our audience. If you want to hang around for one second, I'll I'll give Sounds you your good. final goodbye as well. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time.